Well, last week we had the uh, baptisms, and so the week before we started into 1 Kings. So if you are new to our study on Wednesday nights, this, uh, you're not, you haven't missed much. In fact, I just want to share two quick slides to remind us of the introduction to the book of 1 Kings if you weren't here two weeks ago. First and Second Kings were originally one book in a Hebrew Bible called Melachim, meaning kings. The writer is unknown. Some say Ezra or Ezekiel. Jewish tradition says Jeremiah, but we honestly don't know. Of course, God is the ultimate uh, author of all of it. Who inspired, we're not exactly sure. In addition, First and Second Kings cover a period of about 400 years. First Kings picks up where Second Samuel left off. This is the final year of David's life. He dies in chapter 2 at the age of 70 after ruling Israel for 40 years. And so we've come now to chapter 2. This is where we left off and we're going to read about the death of David. And um, it, it is somewhat, you know, sad here, but every life comes to an end. And um, this is the end of David's life. This is the end of his reign. He is a very interesting individual. He, uh, there's a tender side to him as a shepherd, and there's a fierce uh, side to him as a warrior. And uh, his life is divided into a period of being a shepherd, a period of being a warrior, and a period of being a king, uh, almost uh, I, I exactly in three parts like that. And yet God used him. Of course, his biggest failure was his adultery with Bathsheba, and it gets pasted across the Bible that we're talking about it still here today after about 3,000 years. And yet he is a reminder to us also that not only was he a man who failed and who sinned, but he was a man who also embraced and understood and received the mercy and forgiveness of the Lord. That he was a man after God's heart, that even though he had different failures in life, he also was a man who had a heart for God, and he was quick to repent, and he had that tender side to him that was broken. And he would write Psalms about his broken condition after the prophet Nathan would confront him about his sin. And so, a good reminder to us that even though we at times will sin against the Lord and we will fail Him and we will disappoint Him, and to say nothing about disappointing ourselves, that God is also a God of mercy. He is a God of forgiveness. He does not discard David. He continues to use David. But as Alan Redpath once said about David, he, after his failure, he would soar again, but he would soar as if a wing with clipped Wing, as, as if a bird with clipped wings. He would never quite soar as high. But the Lord would not discard him. The Lord would still use him. And we come now to the end of his life here in chapter 2. And he is surrounded by his loved ones. And primarily we are seeing here in this scene in chapter 2, he is surrounded by his son Solomon, who will succeed him as king. Solomon was God's choice. David had other sons. But unfortunately, a few of his sons rebelled against him. A few of his sons are now dead because of their rebellion or because of their sin. And, and so Solomon is the one that God has providentially chosen. When we get here to chapter 2, David dies at the age of 70. And the last words, his, the final counsel of a dying man to his son Solomon is what we're going to read as chapter 2 opens. Solomon here in chapter 2 is about 17 years of age. He is going to assume a very um, large responsibility by becoming king at a very tender young age as a teenager. And, and yet this is God's choice. Uh, so those of you who are young here, uh, if you're still a teenager, um, please keep in mind that God can and does still use you. Um, the real issue is, is uh, you know, not how qualified we are. It's, it's that God uses those who are available to Him. And those who have a willing heart, and those who are teachable, and those are the ones that God can use. He uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things for His glory. And He's going to use Solomon. Now Solomon's going to have his failures too. But this is the man that God has chosen now, even at the tender age of about 17. So here we are, chapter 2. Start reading with me in verse 1. It says, Now the days of David drew near that he should die. And he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. That's a common expression in those days. Like, I'm going to return to the soil. 
dust, from dust we are created, to dust we shall return. I go the way of all the earth. Now, now listen to what he says here to his son. And, and think about this, because, you know, if all of us have the, I'll use the word luxury, of being able to say final things to our loved ones as we are dying, um, what would be those things most important that you would want them to hear? And, and I say luxury because sometimes people die suddenly and they don't get that ability to say those final parting words or to say those final things that, that they wish that they might say. Um, those of you know that I lost my dad recently back in December and, and I was with him when he died and you know, just having some of those last minutes with your father. I'm, I'm reading the story here today, preparing for tonight's study, and you know, my dad said some things to me and, and just before he died, and just before he basically went into a coma with hospice care, and, and, um, and, I, and I, w I wrote those things down, you know, because those are some tender things that uh, if you have the chance to say, to say. And so this is, I want you to picture here this tender moment, the 70-year-old dad, speaking to a 17-year-old son, saying these last words of instruction. And so he says, I go the way of all the earth, and he says to Solomon, be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do, and wherever you turn, that the Lord may fulfill his word which he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth, with all their heart and with all their soul, he said, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Moreover, you know also what Joab the son of Zuriah did to me, and what he did to the two commanders of the armies of Israel, to Abner the son of Ner, and Amasa the son of Jether, whom he killed. And he shed the blood of war in peacetime, and put the blood of war on his belt that was around his waist, and on his sandals that were on his feet. Therefore do according to your wisdom, and do not let his gray hair go down to the grave in peace. But show kindness to the sons of Barzillai the Gileadite, and let them be among those who eat at your table. For so they came to me when I fled from Absalom your brother. And see, you have with you Shimei, the son of Gera, a Benjamite from Baharim, who cursed to me with a malicious curse in the day when I went to Mahanaim. But he came down to meet me at the Jordan, and I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with the sword. Now therefore, do not hold him guiltless, for you are a wise man, and know what you ought to do to him, but bring his gray hair down to the grave with blood. And those are the last words of David. Now, there's a part of me that really wishes he had been a little more, you know, like personable to Solomon, like, I love you, son. Like, there's nothing in here, like, I love you. Um, there's, there's, you know, this is very kind of um, mechanical almost, and even to the point where the last thing that he says is, I want you to get vengeance on some people that I didn't like. But I want to focus first on the first part of what he says to Solomon, and then we'll move on to why he says this about Joab and Shimei. Because I, I want us to first note here that when he says in verse 2, back up in verse 2, I go the way of all the earth, you know, we're drawing out principles from these chapters, and here's uh, something just very practical from chapter 2. Mankind shares a common destiny. Be prepared to meet your maker. Uh, David knew he was dying. And you get this sense here that he's, he's ready to go. He's got some parting words, but he's ready to go. He's ready to meet his maker. Uh, you know, in Psalm 17, David would write this at the end of Psalm 17, verse 15. He said, I will see you, your face. He's talking to the Lord. It's a psalm as a prayer. He says, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. And David anticipated this day well in advance. He was ready to meet his maker. You know, e even at the end of Psalm 23, where he talks about surely goodness and mercy 
shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He's not talking about the temple forever. He, the, the house of the Lord hadn't even been built in his lifetime. He was talking about living ultimately in the presence of the Lord in heaven, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David was ready. There comes a day of accountability for every single one of us where we go the way of the earth. From dust we are created, to dust we shall return. And the question we need to all answer is, are we ready to meet our Maker? Are we ready to face the Lord one day? And David was ready. He said, I'm, I'm ready to go the way of the earth. He was ready to depart. He knew he was going to see his Lord. And he knew he was going to be in the presence of the Lord forever. And he instructs Solomon there, and he says, be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. Now, prove yourself a man is another way of saying, take courage. So he's saying, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. And he's saying this because he knows, especially, he's looking into the eyes of a teenager who's about ready to assume the most powerful kingdom on the planet. And he's saying to him, you're going to need courage, and you're going to need to be strong in order to do what God has called you to do. But then he goes on to say where the source of his strength and courage is going to come from. Because he adds there, and he says, and keep, verse 3, and keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies. Now, I looked it up, and those are actually four different Hebrew words. Uh, hukah, mitzvah, mishpat, eduth. But basically what David is, he's using all these different words to basically say, keep the commandments and the moral code of God. Don't stray from God's word because that will be the source of your strength and your courage. So it's another good takeaway for us from this chapter. Great responsibilities require great strength and courage. Great strength and courage come from walking in the ways of the Lord and keeping his commandments. And that's what David is saying to his son. You're going to need strength and courage, son, because you're about to take on a great responsibility. And the only way you're going to really get strength and courage for what you are facing is if you walk closely with the Lord and obey all his commandments, that you may prosper in all that you do, wherever you turn, that the Lord may fulfill his word which he spoke concerning me. And, and the Lord had said this to David. He said, if, if your sons take heed to their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, he said, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. So this is David's charge to his son. Stay close to the Lord, son. Walk in all his ways, and then the Lord will be with you. He will prosper you. He will take care of you. Be strong and courageous and draw near to the Lord. That's, that's his last words on a personal level to his son. Now, he gives instruction also to Solomon, and he says there's a couple of people you're going to have to deal with after I'm dead, and one is Joab. He mentions there in verse 5. Now, Joab is David's nephew. Joab, Joab's mother is David's sister. And Joab is an interesting guy because he was fiercely loyal to David. This is this is sad on a few different levels because David is basically saying to Solomon, you're going to have to take him out. And, and the reason why things turn sour near the end of David's reign with Joab is because Joab, though he was fiercely loyal to David, he was loyal to a fault. And, and this is what I mean. Joab started to take matters into his own hands and he did not always obey the king's order because he, all, he was a little too close to the king. He always felt like he knew better than what the king was saying for the king's sake. He actually did things that he thought would help the king, even though it was disobeying the king, because in some respects, Joab got to the place where he thought he knew better than the king. And, you know, David, I, you know, I know really what you're saying, but I think I know what's even better for you. So he actually did things out of a heart of loyalty, but he was loyal to a fault. And so he ended up killing some people that he shouldn't have killed, and, and David... Um, mentions them. He said, you know, he, he killed the armies, he killed Abner. He mentions Abner there in, in verse 5. Uh, and, and he killed uh, Amasa. Uh, both of them had been commanders of Israel's army at different times. 
And David said, and Joab killed him. And, and he wasn't supposed to kill him. And so he just, he got a little bloodthirsty near the end of his command. Joab was commander of, of the Lord's army, of, of Israel's army. And, and David's like, this guy's trouble. Because even though he was loyal to me, he was loyal to a fault, he started taking matters into his own hands, he wasn't obeying me, he's going to give you trouble. Especially because Solomon is this young teenager. So, so, you know, think about that dynamic where you've got Joab, who's now, you know, quite a bit older than Solomon, thinking he knows better. If he thought he knew better than David, you better believe he thinks he knows better than Solomon. And so David is challenging Solomon like, you're going to have to deal with this guy. He's no good. He's, he's killing people, and he even, he even shed the blood of war in peacetime, he adds there in verse 5, and he put the blood of war in his belt. In other words, he was killing people in peacetime that he shouldn't have been killing them as if he's in battle, and he's dropping his sword in its sheath, and he's spreading the blood of those he's killing on his own you know, uniform and onto his sandals. He goes, this guy has just gone off the rails, he says, basically. And so he says, therefore, do according to your wisdom and do not let his gray hair go down to the grave in peace. Like, you're going to have to deal with this guy. And then, he, and then David shifts, though, to say, between Joab and Shimei, he's going to say, you're going to have to deal with these two. But there's this guy in the middle, Barzillai, there in verse 7. He goes, but I want you to show kindness to Barzillai. Now, if you were with us in our study of the books of First and Second Samuel, you remember that in 2 Samuel, another of David's sons, Absalom, rebelled against David, tried to usurp his authority. Absalom tried to take the throne of his father, David. David vacated the throne. He left. He went to the Mount of Olives and, and the palace guard with him. And as he fled the scene in order to go to Mahanaim for his own safety, there was this guy, Barzillai, who met him along the road and brought David supplies and brought David food and showed his loyalty to David. And David on his deathbed remembered kindness to this guy. And he says to Solomon, show kindness to the household of Barzillai because he, he was kind to me and he brought me supplies. And an hour when I was on one of my darkest days, this guy came to my aid and he loved me. And so I want you to show kindness to him. And then in verse 8, David calls out another guy in addition to Joab. He calls out this guy Shimei. Now, Shimei was the guy, as David was fleeing, same scene, David was fleeing Jerusalem because Absalom was trying to take over the throne. And Shimei is this guy who comes along and he starts, you know, kicking up dust on David. He's like cursing at David. He's like, you're no good. You know, you're a weak king. Just run for your life. After the attempted coup was over and Absalom was killed and David returns to Jerusalem, Shimei is like, I, I really do love you. I, I don't know why I said all the things I said and can you just forget that ever happened? And David was actually merciful to him. And David said to Shimei, okay, listen, all is well. I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to kill you. And he makes that promise. And David carried out his promise. But on his deathbed, he goes, Solomon, uh, I said I wouldn't kill him, but you can. <laughs> and that's what he's telling him here. He's like, I, I was a man of my word. I didn't kill this dude, though I wanted to. I gave him mercy, but now you're in charge. So go get him, tiger. He says, this guy was malicious to me. He said, he came down to meet me at the Jordan, and I swore to him, this is verse 8, I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with the sword. But, but then verse 9, he goes, this says to Solomon, Now therefore do not hold him guiltless, for you are a wise man and know what you ought to do to him, but bring his gray hair down to the grave with blood. Now, you know, so Solomon's taken all this in. And uh, I'm sure he's weeping there. You know, this is an emotional moment. His dad is dying. And, and he's being handed, you know, the royal scepter. And he's like, you're in charge now. And so try to imagine everything that Solomon is dealing with, grief, um, feeling overwhelmed, um, you know, taking on the responsibility of leadership at such a young age. I mean, imagine, imagine just the weight and the grief and all the mixed emotions that he's feeling here. And so verse 10 says, and so David rested with his fathers and he was buried in the city of David. Now, that's Jerusalem. By the way, we don't, we don't know where David is buried today. There's no, there's no um, tomb there, the tomb of David. There is no tomb of David. Nobody knows where it is. So maybe one day it'll be discovered. But he's buried there in the city of David. That's what the record says. 
And the period that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. Seven years he reigned in Hebron, and in Jerusalem he reigned 33 years for a total of 40. And then Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his kingdom was firmly established. Now, verse, verse 13, now Adonijah, this is another of David's sons, Adonijah the son of Haggith, Haggith was one of David's wives, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon. So she said, do you come peaceably? And he said, yeah, peaceably. Moreover, he said, I have something to say to you. And she said, we'll say it. Now, before we see this conversation, a little refresher. Adonijah tried to do the same thing that his brother Absalom had done. That is, Adonijah also tried to uh, put himself forward as the next king of Israel. He saw dad starting to die, and he thought, by virtue of the fact that at this particular time, Adonijah was probably the oldest surviving of David's sons. Adonijah thought he is the likely heir. And even though he knew that Solomon was God's choice, Adonijah thought, you know what? I can change everybody's mind, and I really should be king. And he tries to put himself forward, and, and, and David ends up calling the priest and saying, you better go and anoint Solomon publicly so that everybody knows what, what my... You know, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting Solomon to be crowned king because that's God's choice. And so we got to do this publicly to put, a, put down Adonijah's revolt. So that whole thing happened. Now, Adonijah uh, cries out for mercy. And Solomon gives Adonijah mercy and doesn't kill his half-brother for this attempted coup. But now Adonijah, now dad's dead, and Adonijah, he, he can't seem to learn here. So Adonijah is going to be like, well, you know, dad's dead, and so, you know, maybe there's still time for me to become king, even though Solomon's been, you know, anointed and crowned. But here he comes to Bathsheba. So he comes to Solomon's mom. Bathsheba now is the surviving widow of, of King David. And Adonijah says, I got something to say. And she's like, do you come in peace? Because, you know, he led a revolt last time. And he's like, yeah, 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 I come in peace. Okay, she says, we'll say on. And so he says, verse 15, he says, you know that the kingdom was mine. <laughs> well, no, it wasn't. This is what you call visions of grandeur, ladies and gentlemen. So he, he's got visions of grandeur. Only a handful of people of malcontents had joined him in his little attempted coup. But, um, but he, anyway, visions of grandeur. He's like, you know that the kingdom was mine, and all Israel had set their expectations on me. No. That I should reign. No. However, the kingdom has been turned over and has become my brother's, Solomon's, for it was his from the Lord. So he knows. He knows it's from the Lord. Now I ask one petition of you. Do not deny me. And she said to him, say it. And then he said, please speak to King Solomon, for he will not refuse you, I mean, you're his mom, that he may give me Abishag the Shunammite as my wife. All right, little refresher course here. Who's Abishag? Remember, she was the living electric blanket for King David. If you were here, you remember, was, as David started to get old, the Bible says he couldn't keep himself warm, so they got him a young Shunammite virgin woman, and she would lie with the king just to keep him warm. There were the, warm. There was no funny business going on, but the idea is that she was considered part of the king's harem. Now, here's the dynamic at this time that you need to understand. Even though there wasn't any funny business between David and Abishag, um, the, I, the fact of the matter is that he had brought her into the palace, and now that he's dead, Adonijah sees this as a way of trying again to put himself forward as king, because the idea in those ancient customs were that if you took the harem of the king, you would then be seen as the king. The, a, a succeeding king would usually inherit the harem of the king before him. So Abishag is, uh, rather, uh, Adonijah is trying this last attempt to assert himself as king by taking Abishag as his wife. And so now Bathsheba hears this, and she said, very well, I will speak for you to the king. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a dumb woman. She realizes this is an absurd request, and Adonijah is probably going to get killed for this. But she realizes this guy is a problem. This guy's a big problem. So, of course, I will gladly take your request to the king. 
because she knows this guy's going to die for this request. But she plays him, and here she goes. She, she, it says, Bathsheba therefore went to King Solomon, verse 19, to speak to him for Adonijah. And the king rose up to meet her and bowed down to her, showing respect, and sat down on his throne and had a throne set for the king's mother. So she sat at his right hand. And then she said, I desire one small petition of you. Do not refuse me. And the king said to her, Ask it, my mother, for I will not refuse you. So she said, Let Abishag the Shunammite be given to Adonijah, your brother, as wife. And King Solomon answered and said to his mother, Now why do you ask Abishag the Shunammite for Adonijah? He said, Ask for him the kingdom also. He's like, You might as well ask him for the whole kingdom. For he is my older brother. For him and for Abiathar the priest and for Joab the son of Zariah. Now just circle those two names again, Abiathar and Joab. Joab, remember, was David's final request, like get rid of that guy. Abiathar and Joab were two people who joined with Adonijah in the attempted revolt to take the king, to take the, the throne. And so Solomon's like, you, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. You, you want me to give Abishag to Adonijah. You might as well give him the whole kingdom. And that's what... Uh, that's what uh, Abiathar the priest, that's what Joab the commander wanted anyway. So, so like, why are you asking this? And then, and, then he, and then it says, Then King Solomon swore by the Lord, saying, verse 23, May God do so to me, and more also, if Adonijah has not spoken this word against his own life. Now therefore, as the Lord lives, who has confirmed me and set me on the throne of David my father, and who has established a house for me as he promised, Adonijah shall be put to death today. And so King Solomon sent by the hand of Benaiah, Benaiah is going to end up being the commander of the Israeli army under Solomon. He, he had Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and he struck him down, and he died. So, no more Adonijah. Uh, Solomon is young, but he's tough. He's like, I'm, I'm not putting up with this. this. This is rebellion. This is sedition, and Adonijah is going to die. Now, again, this is not like being merciless, this is, this is just exacting justice. Mercy was shown to Adonijah. Glance back at the end of chapter 1 in your Bibles there. At the end of chapter 1, look at the last couple of verses. Because when Adonijah, after this attempted coup was put down, Adonijah asked for mercy. And look what Solomon does. At the end of chapter 1, verse 52 and 53. Then Solomon said, if he proves himself a worthy man, not one hair of him shall fall to the earth. But if wickedness is found in him, he shall die. And so King Solomon sent them to bring him down from the altar, because Adonijah was clinging to the altar asking for mercy. And he came down and fell down before the King Solomon, and Solomon said to him, go to your house. That was mercy at the end of chapter 1. As long as you're a good little boy and you go to your house and you don't cause any more problems, you're going to be fine. So it wasn't like Solomon was just like having a bad day. You know what? I'm just going to go around killing people. What he decided was, I gave mercy to this guy, and he didn't receive mercy, so now he's going to get justice. And so Solomon was right in exacting justice here. Well, keep reading because now we're not done with uh, eliminating a few people here. And so verse 26, and, and to Abiathar the priest, again, Abiathar was part of the rebellion with Adonijah. And, so, and to Abiathar the priest, the king said, Go to Anathoth, to your own fields, for you are deserving of death. Notice the mercy. But I will not put you to death at this time, because you carried the ark of the Lord God before my father David, and because you were afflicted every time my father was afflicted. And so Solomon removed Abiathar from being priest to the Lord, that he might fulfill the word of the Lord which he spoke concerning the house of Eli at Shiloh. Then news came to Joab. Here we go. For Joab had defected to Adonijah, though he had not defected to Absalom. Again, those two sons of David, Adonijah and Absalom. Joab was loyal to David when Absalom tried to take the throne. But he was not loyal to David when Adonijah tried to take the throne. And so Joab fled to the tabernacle of the Lord and took hold of the horns of the altar. That's what you do when you're, when you're 
appealing for mercy, mercy of the court, and he's holding on to the horns of the altar. And King Solomon was told, Joab has fled to the tabernacle of the Lord. There he is by the altar. And then Solomon sent Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, this is, this is the hit man, and he said to him, Go, strike him down. And so Benaiah went to the tabernacle of the Lord and said to him, Thus says the king, Come out. And he said, No, but I will die here. And Benaiah brought back word to the king, saying, Thus said Joab. And thus he answered me, like, I tried, but he said he wasn't going to come off the altar. And then the king said to him, Do as he has said, and strike him down and bury him, that you may take away from me and from the house of my father the innocent blood which Joab shed. And so the Lord will return his blood on his head, because he struck down two men more righteous and better than he, and killed them with the sword, Abner the son of Ner, the commander of the army of Israel, and Amasa the son of Jether, the commander of the army of Judah, though my father David did not know it. Their blood shall therefore return upon the head of Joab and upon the head of his descendants forever. But upon David and his descendants, upon his house and his throne, there shall be peace forever from the Lord. And so Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, went up and struck and killed him, and he was buried in his own house in the wilderness. The king put Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, in his place over the army, and the king put Zadok, the priest, in place of Abiathar. So you see, Solomon is cleaning house here. And he's like, I got to get rid of the malcontents. I got to get rid of the division. I got to get rid of the discord, the strife, the rebellion. Um, and, and so he's, he's cleaning house here. He's being merciful. At the same time, he's being just. And so there are times that he gives mercy. And there are times then that they violate the mercy and he's going to give them justice. And Joab had chances. And um, he, he carries out his father's request and he strikes Joab and he has him killed. And then he puts Zadok in as the priest in replace of Abiathar. And Benaiah now is the commander of the army instead of Joab. Now comes Shimei. Then the king sent and called for Shimei and said to him, Build yourself a house in Jerusalem. And dwell there, and do not go out from there anywhere. Now I want you to hear this is mercy. For it shall be on the day you go out and cross the brook Kidron, know for certain you shall surely die, your blood shall be on your own head. So he's given Shimei a chance. He's like, you know, you mistreated my dad. And it doesn't, it doesn't say here, so I, I don't know if he told Shimei, like, Dad wants you dead. Um, but maybe he kept that to himself. But he's like, you know, just build yourself a house in Jerusalem, be a good little boy, stay in a house, don't go anywhere. And then you can live. You know, people can come and visit you, just don't go out. And Shimei said to the king, there in verse 38, the saying is good, I like this idea, I get to live. Just under house arrest, he's going to have, you know, probably the ankle monitor and that whole thing. So he said to the king, the saying is good, as my lord the king has said, so your servant will do. And so Shimei dwelt in Jerusalem many days. Now it happened at the end of three years that two slaves of Shimei ran away to Achish, the son of Makkah, the king of Gath. And they told Shimei, saying, Look, your slaves are in Gath. And so Shimei arose, saddled his donkey, uh oh, and went to Achish at Gath to seek his slaves. And Shimei went and brought his slaves from Gath. And Solomon was told that Shimei had gone from Jerusalem to Gath and had come back. And then the king sent and called for Shimei and said to him, uh, excuse me, did I not make you swear by the Lord and warn you, saying, know for certain that on the day you go out and travel anywhere, you shall surely die? And you said to me, the word I have heard is good. Remember? Why then have you not kept the oath of the Lord and the commandment that I gave you? The king said, moreover to Shimei, you know as your heart acknowledges all the wickedness that you did to my father David. Therefore the Lord will return your wickedness on your own head. The king Solomon shall be blessed and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. And so the king commanded Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, here's the hit man again, and he went out and struck him down, and he died. And thus the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. I have one last point for us before we close out tonight. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Now, I didn't come up with that principle. That's straight out of Matthew 12, 25. That's what Jesus said. 
A house divided against itself cannot stand. And so Solomon knew that there's too much division in the house. There's too much rebellion. There's too much of a lack of respect for authority. There is too much selfishness. There is too much pride. And in order really for this house to stand, he has to deal with all the rebellion and all the malcontents. But it wasn't without mercy. I mean, Solomon tried to be merciful to these guys, and they violated the mercy, and so they end up dying. The other verse I, get, I gave you there on, on the screen for this point is Proverbs 22.10, which says this. This is just a, an important principle. Cast out the scoffer, and contention will leave. Yes, strife and reproach will cease. And sometimes um, we have to deal with where there's division and strife, or else it will eat a family alive, it'll eat an organization alive, it'll eat a church alive, it'll eat a business alive. And um, those of you who you know, have had to run businesses or organizations, you know how painful it can sometimes be when you have to let people go because they are just a source of strife. But if you let them stay, it'll ruin the place. And you know, it's, it's not always easy to make those kind of decisions. Um, and, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm not saying kill somebody. I'm just saying, <laughs> I want to make that clear. But I am saying sometimes you need to fire people uh, or, or, you, or you need to, you know, call somebody out in the family and say, you know, you're causing division in our household and we're not taking this anymore and you're not welcome here if you're going to continue to bring strife into our home. You know, sometimes you have to say the hard things in order for there to be real peace and unity in the organization, the business, the church, or the home. And, um, and it's the hard thing to do, but it's sometimes the necessary thing to do. When we allow people to cause contention, strife, disunity, friction, chaos, you're, you're not doing them any good, and you're not doing the organization or the family or the church any good. And so sometimes these decisions have to be made and may God give us wisdom when they do need to be made. And again, you're not doing the person any good either um, because they, they're under the impression that they can get away with this and they can continue to just be as nasty and divisive and as they want to be. And nobody's going to call them out, nobody's going to confront them, or nobody's going to fire them. And they need to learn too because uh, it's going to be destructive for them personally if, if they're not confronted in, in some way. So. Lots of principles and lessons to learn. We'll, we'll pick it up there next time, but let's, let's tonight have a word of prayer and bring our study to a close. Father, we thank you for your word, and we, we uh, thank you, Lord, for how you teach us things through the pages of Scripture. Here's young Solomon taking on a huge responsibility, and in the next chapter we're going to see how we, how we praise for wisdom and discernment. You give that to him and much more. And, and we pray, God, for the same thing, that you would help us uh, in whatever, whatever capacity we serve, that you would help us always to have wisdom and discernment, and you would help us to be wise about things. We need you, Lord. We need you to help us, to guide us, to direct us, to counsel us. And so we thank you for the counsel of your word tonight. We pray that you'll help us to learn from these things and to grow from these things, and we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen.